What up, guys? This is Dave Gordon. I'm back with my mate, Kyle Copey. How's it going, Kyle? What's going on? I'm glad you called me your mate, like some Australian. Thank you. That's a lovely accent you have. New Jersey? Austria. Austria! I'm back with this bloke, Kyle Copey. <laughs> this is not Pints with Aquinas, mate. G'day. G'day, everybody. G'day, how are you? G'day, mate. Let's put another shrimp on the barbie. Crikey. Okay. Um, so, as you guys know, there has been a new motu proprio released papal document by Pope Francis, and I'm going to butcher the pronunciation, which is ad theologium promovendum. Um, it's not bad. That's not a bad attempt. Yeah. It's, it's not like Desiderio Desiderver, you know, whatever that one was, right? Desideravi. Yeah, <laughs> and I would quibble i i still say the the v's with the w sound because i learned wheelock um, yeah classical latin versus ecclesial latin right or as i like to call it real latin <laughs> versus later church latin wow shots fired <laughs> um anyway it, the release of this document of course it starts the whole cycle over again which is pope francis releases something um, and then essentially the stratosphere erupts in a bunch of very uncharitable interpretations and kind of mudslinging and cherry picking parts out to plug into a grander conspiracy theory that Pope Francis is a puppeteer kind of making the church dance like a marionette. Um, in order to achieve some nefarious end, uh, some Peronist plot, some um, – he wants to take us down some road, and he's like a chess grandmaster, essentially just putting his pieces into place and, where he can eventually kind of checkmate um, the, the church and her orthodox and traditional doctrines. That, that is uh, the narrative that everything is read into. Um, so Kyle and I, you know, we want to discuss that today and kind of unpack this a little bit and just kind of, you know, cool everyone off and assure everyone that the sky is in fact not falling, um, as we are so frequently told by a Catholic punditry class that likes to swell its numbers through, you know, various scandals and faux scandals and, you know, a lot of fear mongering. Yeah, a lot of embellishment going on out there. And, you know, I think there needs to be a voice that really calls people back to sobriety, to a sober look at what's happening in the church, because none of this should be surprising. This is complete outgrowth of the emphasis of Vatican II. It's an outgrowth of the direction that the church took after Vatican II, which is decidedly, you know, we appreciate scholasticism. We love scholasticism. And, you know, Aquinas was absolutely formative for so much of Catholic thought. It's not that the church is just like, you know, poo-pooing that or marginalizing its importance. It's saying yes, but manualism is not enough. And that's going to be a consistent emphasis of the church, you know, and that's what this ecumenical council was telling Christians. It, it did want to bring the church into the light of the 20th and 21st century, not to let the bad into the church, but so that the church's right, light could radiate outward into society all the more effectively. So uh, people who are looking at this with suspicion, at this trend with suspicion, you know, they're going to have a perennial problem because this trajectory for the church is not going to stop. The pastoral trajectory that direction for the church is not going to all of a sudden like stop. We're not going to get a pope who all of a sudden hits the brakes and is like, you know what? Vatican II messed up. And we're going to look at that in a second, like Gaudium et Space and what it says um, about interpreting the signs of the times and going out and dialoguing with the culture, not to imbibe what's poisonous and bad from the culture, but to, again, shine forth what's good from the bosom of the church into the culture and be in a place to more effectively evangelize the culture. Because ultimately, and we talked about this a couple episodes ago, Kyle, evangel evangelism is relational. It's relationship-based. So what Pope Francis is doing here, and we're going to talk about that in this motu proprio, is saying the ivory towers theology is not enough. It is insufficient to accomplish our end and to evangelize the world. 
Um, I don't know. That's my first take. And I want to get into yours, obviously, because you have a bunch to say, and we're going to kind of unpack this document for the audience, um, obviously going through it in the hermeneutic of trust that we know is the proper hermeneutic for Catholics um, when reading magisterial works. But first, just like an announcement. Do you want to, should you, or do you want me to? Breaking news, uh, drum roll, please. So, uh, you know, I could never do the drum roll actually. So now you're just putting me on the spot. We can't. Yes. I mean, just just imagine there is some type of snare drum in the background or something like that. Well, it's like on Christmas vacation when they're all trying to do the drum roll before he plugs in the lights, and then like some of them are just like that's what I have to do because I can't like roll my R's or do any of those fancy uh, fancy sounds. I dedicate this house. To the Griswold family Christmas. Oh. Drum roll, please. Oh, oh, uh. There needs to be some fanfare going on here because we have finally decided on a name for this channel. Many of you know this channel as simply uh, this man's name over here, <laughs> David Gordon. This is David Gordon's channel. Um, you know, he had he was involved in, uh, you know, another channel back in the day. We won't get into that, but uh, he struck out on his own. He has his own channel under his own name, as as one should. Um, didn't have a name uh, for his channel besides his his God given, you know, <laughs> first and, and last name there. That's that's Christian name, his Christian name. Um, and that's that's totally fine. Uh, I came on with Dave um, not even six months ago. Dave brought me on as a partner to this channel. We are co-hosts. We are co-owners technically of this channel. Um, I, many people didn't actually know that, but uh, but now you do. And we have finally, after months of agonizing over what in the world do we call this thing, uh, we have decided on a name, and uh, as as the date of this recording, we're recording this. Actually, we're into the next day, so I can't even say that. Uh, but technically, yesterday was uh, All Souls Day, right? So uh, I'm gonna chalk this up to some kind of intercession from one of the holy souls out there praying for us to to come up with a name, uh, and it is this. So here's where you're gonna get out your drum roll. Uh, the name for this channel going forward, and we're going to get, you know, new show open logo, and you'll see the branding coming on our YouTube channel there. All uh, fancy and official like, see? It, it's it's going to be, it's going to be real fancy, huh? Uh, the name, here you go. And I'm, I'm going to make sure I get this right this time. <laughs> Kyle and Dave Contramundum. And if you don't know what that means, it's more Latin, people. So... Go back to freshman year Latin. If you took freshman year Latin, contra mundum, Kyle and Dave against the world. What do we think? Leave a comment if you like it. Hopefully yeah, I actually want to hear what people say. <laughs> Please leave a comment. I mean, we like hearing what you say in the comments anyway. Um, and, you know, we're going to do more shows where we interact with those and especially we'll go live and stuff. But on this, I am particularly interested. I feel like it's like the theological Bill and Ted's excellent adventure, minus like the being stoners and the funny accents and stuff. I'm Bill. This is Ted. We're from the future. Although people say I have a California accent, I don't think that's actually correct, but if if it is, whatever. Um, Wait, so you maybe mean you're, you're not accent. like an actual surfer dude? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I did take that in college and fail it. I was going to say, yeah, you took a surfing class in college, and ironically enough, yeah, you, the guy from California, failed the surfing class. I was such a bad student as an undergraduate, I failed surfing because I just stopped going because it was at like five in the morning. That's, yeah, that's correct. My, no, my but it, 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 it will be, it will be an adventure, uh, like Bill and Ted, um, and yeah, so uh, hopefully you like the name, guys. We we really, like I said, we agonized over this thing for so long. We didn't know what to call this thing. And uh, we're going to go with that. So we, we've kind of officially branded this channel. And uh, we're going to be reaching out, expanding out rather into different avenues, going on different platforms and all that stuff you're going to have to stay tuned for. But we're really excited about it. 
Yeah, absolutely. Um, so good things to come uh, in the future. Now to go back to the document in question. And first of all, you know, like I said, I'm not trying to be uncharitable, but we know the MO now, right? We know what happens every single time the Pope puts out a new document or makes some statement. Every time he opens his mouth. Yeah. It's (laughs) there is a, a, a cottage industry dedicated to parsing his words, just going through them with a fine tooth comb and finding something that, you know, could be taken. that's kind of nebulous. That could be taken in a menacing way and then going and, getting in front of a camera and saying, this is what's happening. Is he trying to further the agenda of the German bishops and radicalize the church and make it into essentially just an arm of the world, an extension of the ideology and worldview that dominates like the post-Christian West? Um, Is he embracing homosexualism? Is he embracing uh, the, the feminist agenda? Is he embracing... Just whatever it is, there, there's always that. That is the lens. It, it's a lens. It's a hermeneutic. It's a way of understanding this pope um, that is it's very particular. Um, and it, it's, it's something that people have settled on. The problem is it's wrong, but it's, it's very predictable. In the wake of any written document, you just know. It'll wait three days, and there are going to be people – getting to the the webcams and um, or to the computer keyboards and saying all kinds of of funny things that the Pope could mean. You know, the prophets of doom saying, oh, this Pope, he's doing this because he has this plan to do this sinister thing to the church, obviously to make it more progressive. Um, and, And that's the narrative that is about 10 or so years in the making. It's... It's been going on for a really long time now, and, you know, I think we just need to pump the brakes on that. But there's an article that's on Catholic World Report. It's a a Larry Chap article, and uh, he's a professor, um, or a retired professor of theology, uh, DeSales University uh, in Pennsylvania, and went to Fordham University for a theology degree. So, you know, good thinker. Fordham is a liberal program, but... um, you know, they have, they, they have a solid reputation as far as, like, academics go, especially in, in theology. So there's a Fordham scholar, and he's saying, uh, he says this in the Catholic World Report article, and if next year's synod ends up with a final document far more in, explicit in its call for the ordination of women to holy orders, the full moral legitimation of the sexual alphabet agenda and a permanent house of commons made up of lay people with co-governing powers with the House of Lords, made up of bishops whose authority will be effectively neutered by the pressure of populist public opinion, then rest assured that the new members of the Pontifical Academy of Theology will be called upon to give it theological cover. So that's that's the take, and we're going to get into essentially what this document does, what this motu proprio does by Pope Francis. But the take at the outset is... He is trying to make theology um, more more organic, more pastoral, uh, essentially to democratize the church and to get the census fidelium, to confuse the authentic census fidelium with essentially popular opinion. And then we're going to take popular opinion and kind of retrofit it into a theological scheme and that's how we're going to do theology from now on. And it's going to be essentially uh, commingling the theology of the church with the ideology of the world. We're going to be borrowing from the world and taking that and retrofitting it into the theology of the church or redoing the theology of the, the church to assimilate the errant ideology of the world. So that's the a- um, accusation that obviously is going to be making the rounds um, that is the narrative that's shaping up about this document, Kyle. Yeah, it's the same situation we have with the Synod in general. This claim, this fear that somehow the Synod is democratizing the church and 
you know, in a certain sense, I could see how people would save that. But in in reality, we need to walk people back off the ledge of of concluding that because the synod ultimately doesn't take the church anywhere. The synod has no, you know, it's not a magisterial arm. It can't do that. There's there's the a couple key steps away from that that provide a protection from the synod doing anything bad with with theology because like per se it can't do that but you know you mentioned that the the papal accusers have been doing this for the past 10 years of the Francis pontificate and that's true and granted i will concede that pope francis has probably given the given them enough ammunition to do that just based on how much he speaks and you know it arguably some of the the imprecision the nebulous the ambiguity enough of that is there for for three things to happen um one the the papal accusers uh two the papal defenders are going to do something with and three the dissident catholic left are going to do something with it Dis- dissident catholic left are going to take that ambiguity and run with it and try to push their own progressive agendas that's one. Oh, look pope francis wants this and this and this and we can um you know we're going to ordain women priests because that's where the pope is headed that's what the the catholic dissident left is going to say that's one based on the you know alleged or actual ambiguity um two and then uh the the papal defenders are going to read it with her her hermeneutic trust and give it the best interpretation possible which is what we're called to do according to catechism um i believe it's uh i forget the exact number but we're to avoid rash judgment that applies to everything not just papal teachings and pronouncements and then three the third group the rad trads are going to like you said Use that fine tooth comb. Where is the heresy? Where can we po- call the Pope out for you know some some hidden agenda, imputing some nefarious motive to the Pope? Where is he leading the church astray with with this airplane interview, this uh, interview with a journalist, this uh, papal document, whatever it is? Where is the heresy in it, and where can we accuse him of doing something wrong? So those are the three groups that latch on to to the many things that that Pope Francis has put out there and this is this is just one of it's not just Francis either cuz it honestly if you look at it they were doing the all three groups were doing the same thing with John Paul II they were doing the same thing with Benedict the 16th granted there was a little less to to kind of parse out and actually explain correctly um but it's just you know different styles different pontificates honestly yeah absolutely and it was harder for them to do Because even though John Paul II did some things that people can see through that as like leaning politically liberal, you know, obviously what he did in terms of development of doctrine on the death penalty, um, people point to things like Assisi, kissing the Quran, all the ecumenism and whatnot. Uh, They that that was they criticized that, but it was harder for them to paint him as like some kind of uber progressive because the progressives in the church hated both of those popes so much. So it's like, you know, the enemy of my enemy is my friend in a lot of ways. It would be really hard to, to convince a bunch of people that John Paul II and uh, Pope Benedict were kind of closet libs or something to that effect. Yeah. But the OG rad trads were doing that. Sure. They were doing that. It's, but it's moved into the mainstream with Pope Francis. Absolutely. um, Because, you know, he, he keeps a wider circle of friends and, you know, some of the people of a more progressive theological bent were obviously, you know, his champions. That doesn't mean they own him. That doesn't mean they're his handlers. It just means he has a wider circle. Uh, but he's also friends with he was friends with Pell and he really respected Pell and he defended Pell. And when Pell criticized him, he's like, I want the criticism. So it's not just, you know, it's just not as open and shut it's for the picture thinkers out there. For the people that like simplistic answers, it's easier to paint um, Pope Francis in a certain way than it was John Paul II and Benedict, yada, yada. Um, Okay, so what's this document do, Kyle? Okay. Uh, Do you want to take it head on? Yeah, let me just – I just want to give people a little bit of background on this document as to what it is. It kind of came out under the radar and – 
a little bit later on, I'll, I'll tell you why I think that is. I mean, all, you know, to a certain extent, a lot of these things that get issued by the Vatican, yeah, they get picked up by, by CNA, by Vatican News, by Ed Penton, whoever it is, you know, you know, the Vaticanistas on the ground pick it up and, and then they tell us, oh, a new papal document came out. Dude, I don't like how we have to call men Eastas, Vaticanistas. I, I always try and change it to Vaticanisto yep. because it seems improper to or call Vaticanist men. or something. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, no, I love I, how we keep calling it this document so we don't have to say ad theologium provo, promo vendum. Exactly. Um, there's no like good cutesy little like shortcut nickname for that one. You can't be like, yeah, ad. That doesn't work. And you don't – it's not really – yeah, promo vendum. You can't really call it that either. So you're kind of stuck saying the whole thing. Just yeah. an observation. I keep calling it this document. That's why, guys, it's because I'm retarded and I can't remember the name. No, I mean, I'm going to call it promo vendum, if anything. It literally means to promote theology. Um, if you don't know about how ecclesial documents work, usually they usually take the, the first phrase or the first few words from the first sentence of the document. The and they sip it, Kyle. They, there you Get go. Get it right. Well, no one's going to know what that means, Dave. So <laughs> I'm going to start telling him what it is. Okay, it's the first few words of the document, and then they make that the title of the document. Sometimes it doesn't even make sense. It's just like the first few words. So this one is to promote theology. Um, okay, uh, that's where they got it from. So it's the promotion of theology document, Dave. How about that? We can call it that. I like that. Yeah. <laughs> so it doesn't make me use big words and stuff. Yeah. So this thing came out uh, November 1st, which at the time of this recording was a couple days ago. Um, uh, maybe once this airs, it'll be a few days ago. Came out November <laughs> 1st. What it is, um, I, you know, I'm, I'm not claiming it's not a magisterial document. It is. All motu proprios are such. Um, it just depends on who they're addressed to to um you know sometimes it's to to the worldwide church sometimes it's just to an individual sometimes it's to to a group um this seems to be i mean it's promulgated for to the universal church in a certain sense because they put it out there uh, but it's concerning specifically a a group within the roman curia uh, a group that probably many people have never heard of. It's and, and there's like a, a hundreds, you know, not hundreds, but there's like a whole slew of these like pontifical commissions. Um, this is the this is actually the pontifical academy for theology. There's a pontifical academy for biblical studies. There's a pontifical academy for Saint Thomas Aquinas specifically. Uh, there's a whole slew of these things in the Roman Curia. There's so many groups within the Roman Curia, and there, then there's a hierarchy to these groups too. You know, just so you know, but we don't have to get into that. So this is the Pontifical Academy for Theology. Um, every well, so just to add, it, you know, this is like it's a motu proprio, so it's making essentially like legal changes. Mm -hmm. But this has a theological argument that undergirds the legal changes that are ultimately being made. So it yeah. certainly has teaching import to us, to the universal church. And I think that's, you know, it's important to highlight that. It's not like this is just, you know, you could issue just like a bald legal order uh, with a motu proprio, but this has got good theological explanation in it. And really, like we said at the beginning, is just an outgrowth of the the kind of worldview the methodology from vatican II. yeah that's important to highlight because i don't want people to twist what i'm saying here and think that oh this is just addressed to this pontifical academy so we don't have to pay any attention to it no there's a reason why this is promulgated to the entire church because it does have import to your theological understanding it is teaching on faith and morals um, rather what we're going to argue it's reiterating an already established teaching on faith and morals so it's not like it's um, really doing anything um, that revolutionary here even though revolutionary is a term used in the document um, so yeah this thing came out um, in italian only and uh, you know i think there's a there's a reason for that. I wish there was an English trans translation because, you know, my web browser, Dave, as yours was, was having a hell of a time trying to translate this thing into English. You know, we had to go through a, a couple different routes to get this thing into English, but we finally did. Chat GPT. Chat GPT. Very yeah. good with its lingual skills. I'm not 
not going to see here and lie. Exactly. So basically, this Pontifical Academy, as, as it's been doing since the 1700s, um, this thing has been around since, I believe, the 1700s. Um, it, it was established, you know, codified probably somewhere around then. Do the homework on that. But uh, every so often they come up with new statutes, you know, uh, governing documents that say what the what the body does, you know, what it's all about. And those have to be papally approved. And this is simply, you know, uh, uh, one thing here is just simply Pope Francis approving their new statutes, but at the same time he's saying, okay, look, there's there's a greater theological significance uh, to me approving this. Sure. Yeah. No. Absolutely. And he goes through that in the first, you know, paragraph of the of the actual motu proprio, where he says the Pontifical Academy of Theology established in the early 18th century under the auspices of Clement the Eleventh, uh, yada yada yada. Um, has consistently embodied the need to place theology at the service of the church and the world throughout its centuries-old existence. It has modified its structure and expanded its purposes as necessary, from an initial place for the theological formation of the clergy in a context where other institutions were lacking and inadequate for this purpose, to a group of scholars tasked with investigating and deepening theological topics of particular relevance." Uh, the updating of the statutes, as desired by my predecessors, has marked and promoted this process. Um, you know, yada, yada, and yada. So, uh, essentially, yes, um, there can be updates and revisioning of the Pontifical Academy of Theology, and that's nothing really threatening. It's just something where it needs to keep pace with uh, the challenges of the world and the culture and the church, really. You know, it's at the service of the church. Uh, it can be for forming clergy. It can be for, for deepening the theological sciences. And ultimately, Pope Francis now, and in keeping with um, really the, the conception of the Second Vatican Council, it, it's, it's going through, an, again, another update, which is, you know, fine to do. He says this in the second paragraph. After nearly five decades, it's time to revise these norms to make them more suitable for the mission that our time demands of theology. Um, a synodal, missionary, and outgoing church must correspond to an outgoing theology. So he's here saying we need to update the Pontifical Academy of Theology so that it is an outgoing theology, one that is decidedly pastoral one that kind of shirks the idea of living in the ivory towers and being um, kind of inbred and inward looking and instead uh, take the theology to the streets, as the kids might say, um, which, again, goes along with the entire thrust, really, of this pontificate. And uh, let's get into that in a second, the Second Vatican Council. I don't know what say you to that, Kyle. Yeah, no, it's this is this is nothing new. I mean, there's there's nothing, as I said before, there's nothing revolutionary in this document. Um, I really think, and it really should be reiterated to people that you can absolutely and easily read this with a hermeneutic of continuity, going back through the pontificate of John Paul II and even all the way back to the Second Vatican Council. And it's funny, I mean, because even Francis himself seems to, even without citing it, he's alluding to the Second Vatican Council, I think in, in a literal phrase that he's using somewhere throughout the document. He also Quote, cites signs of the times, signs he's of the saying, times, study the signs of the times. Yeah. And that's that's found. Uh, that's found where? Where was that? Gaudium at space yeah. uh, section four. So yeah, I'll, I'm just going to read this. Yeah, off. go Unless for it. You yeah. want to. No, go I know yeah, you're in the let's, middle making a point. Go ahead. Okay, so this is you know, the actual reference is in section four, but the 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 preface for that is in section three, so I'll just read them both together. Therefore, this sacred synod, proclaiming the noble destiny of man and championing the godlike seed which has been sown in him, offers to mankind the honest assistance of the church in fostering that brotherhood of all men which corresponds to this destiny of theirs. Inspired by no earthly ambition, the church seeks but a solitary goal, to carry forward the work of Christ under the lead of the befriending spirit. And Christ entered this world to give witness to the truth, to rescue and not sit in judgment, 
to serve and not to be served. Okay, and then it goes on. This is where section four begins. To carry out such a task, the church has always had the duty of scrutinizing the signs of the times and of interpreting them in the light of the gospel. Thus, in language intelligible to each generation, she can respond to the perennial questions which men ask about the, this present life and the life to come, and about the relationship of the one to the other. We must therefore recognize and understand the world in which we live, its explanations, its longings, and its often dramatic characteristics. Some of the main features of the modern world uh, can be sketched as follows, and it goes on to talk about some of the problems that are affecting you know, mankind in then, you know, the 20th century. So we very much have this mandate that comes out of the Second Vatican Council. And we get into this a little bit with like a and, and whatnot, which a lot of people, again, this is one of those phrases that's been weaponized against the hierarchy, against the magisterium, where they're like, oh, aggiornamento means making the church like the world. And that's absolutely, you know, that's untrue. That's um, pretty much just a slander of John the 23rd mm -hmm. and Paul the 6th. John the 23rd said, quote, the deposit of the truths of faith contained in our sacred teaching are one thing, while the mode in which they are enunciated, keeping the same meaning and the same judgment is another. So John the 23rd, essentially, while he's calling for a giornamento and the medicine of mercy to flow out of the church uh, for too long, you know, she just pointed to kind of cold, hard judgments in black letter law, which is, you know, it's good. It has its place. The Council of Trent was beautiful and, and did a great thing in service of the deposit of faith and the church. But, you know, the, the council was calling us to go beyond that for the challenges of the modern world, not in order to walk back doctrine, which is immutable and irreformable, but to take the doctrine now and make it relational, distill it down so you can put it, you can plug it in to um, certain challenges in individual person's lives. And there's not going to be some formulaic conception of a doctrine that you can just throw out and everybody's going to get it. You know, people are, are individuals. And oftentimes, you know, people don't think just through sheer raw analytical logic. They need things put to them in a, a very individualized way, in, a, in kind of a formulation that meets their circumstances. Um, and this was the mandate after Vatican II, was to take this doctrine, take what the Church teaches, which is unblemished, unchanging, true, pure, and bring it into the combat that's taking place in the post-Enlightenment 20th and 21st centuries, where we have a godless society that's cooked up for itself problems that are serious, serious moral problems, serious ethical problems in medicine, um, in bioethics, in uh, war. You know, you have weapons that can wipe out entire populations. You have it, just with the development of the human condition have come a series of questions where now we need not just cold, hard doctrine, but application of the doctrine in an individualized setting with the warmth and charity that is going to draw people to Christ when there are so many imposter theologies and imposter philosophies masquerading as almost more empathetic and more loving than the Christian ideal, which must always uphold truth while still trying to draw people in. So the errand, you know, that's our errand and it's a difficult one, but make no mistake, like that's what Pope Francis is doing here. Um, he is not, in fact, attempting to subvert or democratize the church. And we'll get into that again in a second. Um, you know, those are opening thoughts, Kyle. Yeah, no, it's uh, it's it's important to say that, I think, on the outset, because it is is, is an, it's an accusation that, you know, if, if you're if you're honest about it, you wouldn't just level at at Pope Francis. You'd have to level at his predecessors. You'd have to level at the council itself. And I know some of the the OG rad trads and papal accusers will do that. They were doing it from you know right from when the council ended, um, but it wasn't in the mainstream like we've talked about. And now it is. But those people haven't done their homework and said, oh yeah, actually you know the church has been teaching this 
perennially, actually. And it, it, it's just kind of common sense, too. You don't do theology just as an academic subject. It should actually pervade the way you think and live your life. It's not just a sort of this, like, mental game that you play and then you go and, and live however you want and interact with people and lead them ho however you want. No, there should be some practical import for how you interact with others and conduct your life and try to lead others in the right direction. And that's really where the rubber meets the road in terms of evangelistic application. Because I, I mean, I know a lot of people who know some theology, but they're terrible evangelists. They don't have that charism of learning how to, and it's cliche, but it's true. They don't know how to meet people where they're at. They either, you know, the old Protestant phrase of like trying to shove the Bible down someone's throat or beat someone over the head with some type of doctrine. That's where a lot of people start, um, where they think they can just spew it out and then it's going to have some effect. Yes, to a certain degree, even if someone is not open to the truth, when the truth hits them, because they're made for the truth by God, it's going to have some reverberation, whether that person knows it or not. Um, but that's not always the best approach. That's a good approach with people who you, who you, whom you have authority over, for sure. Like with my children. With my children, I tell them like it is, because I have spiritual and temporal authority over them. So they, they know it in a different way, but I'm still at the same time coming back and reiterating and being more pastoral with them and explaining, well, why the thing is later, you know, once emotions have calmed down, here's why I had that rule in place, or here's why you got punished type of thing. And it's the same. It's even more so how you do with people you don't have authority over that you're trying to evangelize. You, you, you come with them, you find out what their situation is, you find out what their understanding is, you find out what their particular objection is because, I mean, so many people have so many different erroneous starting points. It's like, I don't even know where to begin with this person. So I have to find out about them first. I have to understand their concrete uh, situation, as the Pope talks about in this in this document, uh, starting from their different context, as the Pope talks about in this document, and go from there and sort of tool my approach to evangelization based on all that. Dude, everybody knows that. I mean, not <laughs> hey, your point's dumb, Kyle. Everybody knows that. Sorry, That's what I'm saying no. <laughs> everybody like intuits that, but it's funny that when the magisterium says it, it's looked at askance. It's looked at as like dubious, but if you, everybody knows that if you just walk up to a stranger, it's super hard to like convert them to get them to like walk away from like their errant, uh, Protestant religion or something like that. But if you have a relationship with somebody, if you build a relationship with them and you understand them as a person, everybody also understands that it's much easier to bring that person along and to sow those seeds with efficacy and, and kind of have fruitful discussion with them because there's the basis of love and mutual respect um, where you're kind of showing them and, and they know it's of goodwill and you know they know that they're not just like a number to you but that they're a person that you are approaching um, out of charity and out of, of uh, respect a mutual respect a mutual love and for their own good you're trying to evangelize them everybody understands that everybody understands that good evangelism is ultimately relational it's got the uh, smell of the sheep um, you know it's kind of imbued with that uh, that's something that's taken for granted but when the Pope or the Vatican says it everyone's like He's speaking heresy. Who wants to get rid of the theological sciences? You know what else um, is funny? Is okay. Conservatives understand, and you can read essays by theologians on this that theology is not religious studies. It's not. It's religious studies with plus spiritual gifts, faith, hope, and charity. So the left. You know, the, the bad, like, Jesuit, you know, the, like the token Jesuit liberal um, that's trying to, like, rewrite the New Testament to, like, essentially get rid of all the miracles and make Christ's ministry um, something that is bereft of the supernatural. 
you know, they're doing religious studies because they're theologizing without faith, right? Like theologizing without faith, that's religious studies for the leftist. That's what leftists do. Like, and that's what marks like left wing, um, bad biblical exegesis from like true biblical exegesis, which always takes the, the, the faith, the deposit of faith and upholding it as the starting point. So we know that um, religious studies on the left is essentially theology minus faith. But what Pope Francis is warning us about here and why he's uh, kind of revamping the Pontifical Academy of Theology is precisely because he doesn't want us on the right to be doing religious studies that is theology, theology minus charity. See, because theology minus charity is a form of religious studies also. You know, if you just, if you have every decree from the Council of Trent memorized, but you're, you're using it to just smack people um, in the culture, uh, you know, and it, you're, you're just like winning arguments because obviously Trent is true and it is like the true and good rebuttal to Protestantism. But if you're just smacking them with that, Without the virtue of charity, without this theological virtue of charity, you're really doing religious studies just in the same vein where you might, you know, have one take on a historical event that's totally secular, um, where you might say, you know, that this general in World War II really had this motive for invading, you know, this nation. But this general in, in you're debating somebody who says this general in World War II really had this motive for like an invasion, you know, or something, any historical controversy, that's what you're doing. But in the religious context, that doesn't make what you're doing theology. So I think what he's putting us on on watch for is he's really saying good theology is not armchair theology. It's not strictly intellectual. And you have to understand that theology is not a strictly intellectual science. Now, it is analytical. It is a science. And Pope Francis reaffirms that in this very document, in this very motu proprio. But he's saying don't do armchair theology. Go out there and interact with the cultures. Interact with your surroundings, your environment, the people around you. See what it is that's challenging them. See what it is that they're saying. Um, see what it is that's bothering them and then take this kind of interdisciplinary approach where you're going to people wherever you are, because you're, again, you're not isolated in your own ivory towers, you're interacting, you're rubbing elbows and then, you know, take those problems that you're sensing and kind of do theology so that you can provide answers for these problems as opposed to simply you know, doing theology from a manual and like reiterating what a manual is saying and just developing that by combining it with something else you read in a new manual or just like, you know, the, the way that oftentimes science is developed through this process of growth and synthesis. He's saying to beware of that. He's saying um, your place of recollections, quote, should be at the frontiers. Even good theologians like good pastors should smell of the people in the street and with their reflection, they should pour oil and wine on the wounds of humanity. Openness to the world, to individuals, and the concreteness of their existential situations with their issues, wounds, challenges, and potentials must not be reduced to a tactical attitude. Adapting crystallized content to new situations, but should stimulate theology to epistemological and methodological rethinking, as indicated in the preamble of the Apostolic Constitution Veritatis Gaudium. So, yeah, it's not just taking something from a manual and like noticing something about it and developing it and then trying to, in some ham handed and clumsy way, kind of thrust that into like the eye of the world in order to solve a certain problem. Rather, you know, you're gathering, you're, you're taking in from the world and you are truly dialoguing with that and formulating your theology um, and, and taking the deposit of faith and showing what can the deposit of faith show the world, you know, in this kind of, I don't know. Well, it is, uh, it is, uh, I'm, I'm glad that he used, uh, you know, the, 
epistemological terminology there. I mean, many people who don't know philosophy don't know what that means, but it's uh, you know, it's a, a paradigm shift there. It's it's a new way of thinking of yes, we have concrete dogmas and doctrines that we're not trying to subvert or change in any way. But how those get presented to different groups of people at different times, the presentation is going to vary. I mean, we, we know this just with anyone who's taught different grade levels, right? This is why something like the Baltimore Catechism literally teaches the same thing over and over again in each edition, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, in terms of the old numbering system. It's teaching the same concept if you read them. Okay, we're talking about incarnation in number one. It's going to be a very simplistic explanation because in number one or number zero, it's talking about first communicants or those who have just made their first communion and are not even at the confirmation prep stage. They're, the language that's used in there is going to be, I'm not saying dumbed down, but more appropriate to that particular age group. And it's the same thing with sharing the gospel or sharing some theological truth even with uh, a certain person, you know, depending on their own degree of understanding of it. And if you're just doing theology for the sake of theology, uh, that's probably vain and prideful and selfish. If you're just doing it for fun and you're not, if you don't have the intention of just one drawing closer to God through it, or understanding more about what the Holy Catholic Church teaches in order to live a better life, um, to increase your prayer life, to be a good apologist when you're when you're called to do that, when God opens those doors. If you're just doing it out of some sense of intellectual pride, it's actually, and I'm going to use a crude ter- term here, but it's actually something like mental masturbation. People do this with intellectual things all the time. We know that pedantic person who just, I mean, he knows how to speak five languages. Um, He knows all these like obscure historical facts, and he'll use every opportunity he can to demonstrate the fact that he thinks he knows more than you. That's the type of stuff I think the Pope is getting at here too. He's cautioning us against being, uh, you know, those pedantic theology guys running around trying to correct everyone without a sense of whether we need to to convince them of anything. We're just trying to demonstrate our own knowledge here. And it all gets back to, as you said, that charity issue. And I think even even the Pope somewhere here talks about the, 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 you know, this issue explicitly of this is the charitable thing to do. And it reminds me of that pa- uh, the passage from uh, 1 Corinthians where St. Ta- Paul almost explicitly addresses this issue of charity um, doing all these other things at the expense of charity. He talks about, you know, you can have, this is in 1 Corinthians 13, he says, you can have the gift of prophecy, you can be able to fathom all these mysteries and have all this knowledge, you can know all the theology, so to speak. You could have even faith that can move mountains, but if you don't have love, you're nothing. So the love is kind of the underlying disposition for all of that stuff, the theology, the faith, the prophesying, whatever spiritual charism or gift you can think of. Yeah. Yeah, no, 100%. And um, there's two things I think that the Holy Father is trying to drive home here. So one is motive, and that's what me and you were just talking about. Um, People, the reason we do theology is, you know, for the theological virtues, faith, hope, and charity. Um, you are attempting essentially with this to be charitable, to evangelize out of love for God and neighbor. Um, so he's cautioning us against being so insular with our theology. And again, um, going, hearkening back to the term you just used, like avoiding this as a just sheerly intellectual exercise or some proof of essentially the superiority of our own worldview like that is not a healthy purpose for theologizing sure does it feel good being like yeah we're right we're built on a foundation of rock yeah but that's not what theology is about ultimately the church is about evangelization that is her mission 
It's to save souls. The highest mission of the church is the salvation of souls. So we're talking about motive. He also is talking about method in here. There is a component of this that is talking about method, where everything before has been so analytical that the church has focused on. It's so analytical. You know, it's very deductive. You know, um, we have these truths in Scripture. We have this other truth. So therefore, we can understand this. You know, the Bible says, um, you know, that there is God the Father. The Bible says that there is God the Son. The Bible says that there is God the Holy Spirit. Spirit, Therefore, there is the Holy Trinity. Something like that. And obviously, it's just a crass example coming off uh, the top of my head. But that's very deductive, which is fine. But if you take a philosophy of logic course, you know that there's you know more than one way to skin a cat. There's more than one way to arrive at the truth. You, there's deductive reasoning. There's inductive reasoning. And indeed, you can do a lot with inductive reasoning. And I think what he's pointing out is that the church in the past has, especially in like these manualist traditions, these very scholastic traditions, and those are very near and dear to my heart. Um, they are very appealing to certain types of people, to bookworms, maybe to people who, especially like Catholics, you're brought up, cradle Catholic, brought up in the faith, and it's just like, yeah, I believe all this. I need to know more about it. Like then you can go and it's a very helpful thing to have like these manuals of theology that are just like, well, you know this and you know this, therefore this. And you're like, oh, yeah, that makes sense. The light bulb came on. The light bulb came on in my head. But I think we have to have a realization that in a post-Christian West, you know, a society that's lost its way, it's lost its theological compass, it's lost its moral compass. A lot of the people that we're called to evangelize and dialogue with did not grow up in an atmosphere, in a milieu of, you know, Christian thought. They didn't even grow up where that was like, you know, a little bit separated from them. You know, a lot of people we're talking to are functional pagans in the West. And I think this is coming. This um, post-Vatican II push is coming because the church has recognized the sign of the dang times. We are in a de-Christianized West. The Enlightenment wrought havoc on the West. It destroyed European thought. It destroyed American thought. It gutted Western Christianity. It really did. Like, you don't need to hear it from me, and far be it from me to go into that in this, you know, little podcast when we're already like an hour in. But the Enlightenment ruined people. Most of the values that people, like even conservative Americans, take for granted are steeped in the falsities of the Enlightenment. And so the West is like utterly secularized. And to do dialogue with the post-Enlightenment West is going to require something, a method that, you know, may not, that the manuals just didn't have. So the Pope talks about this. He talks about um, using an inductive method, not a deductive method, but an inductive method, essentially looking outward and seeing patterns and seeing truths that other people can also see and spotting these commonalities and doing theology from that, like observance based theology. That doesn't mean saying like, well, this there's this guy over here who's same sex attracted. So therefore, we're going to uh, affirm his disordered feelings. No, that's not what he's saying. I know that's going to be the knock. As we've seen, that's what they're already gearing us up for, you know, but that's not what that means. Is it, Kyle? That's not what a, a true understanding of like an inductive theology would mean. And you can I mean, I can give examples, but I rattling some off the top of my head. You know, yeah. how about uh, the universal human consent as an argument for God? That's an inductive theology. That's not something that's used by liberals. It's something that's used by sound theologians that have said, you know, every culture has spotted, has had a belief in God, has understood that we're not alone in the universe, that there is a higher power, that there is a deity, that there is a creator, and therefore 
because the human intellect cannot, you know, is made to apprehend truth and cannot be deceived uh, about something uh, universally that involves the human condition itself, you know, not some observation where we can mess up, but uh, an understanding of the human condition itself. All the minds in the world cannot be deceived. Therefore, since all societies have said there's God, there's God. There's a lot of things you can kind of induce, use mm-hmm. inductive reasoning to come to understand. It's not, I don't know, I think, I mean, am I wrong? Are people worried that this is just like the SSA stuff or like, you know, they want people to be feminists or people are feminists, so they're going to bring that into the church? Um, I mean, yeah. yeah, different people are going to use it in different ways, but yeah, you're right what the Pope is getting at here, and I'm I'm glad he alluded to this inductive process because, you know, a more top-down approach is obviously necessary in certain sectors, and we have to maintain that, obviously, just like we maintain the deposit of faith and the dogmas and definitive doctrines and all that stuff. We maintain those things while at the same time finding different and varied ways to communicate them to different people who have different starting points. That's what you're doing when you're employing the inductive process because you're uh, allowing yourself to then, well, really what it, what it does is it opens you up to not different possibilities in the sense of, oh, I'm going to change my thinking about something I'm already convicted of or that I need to be convicted of because the Catholic Church requires me to be convicted of that thing. No, you're not changing any of your first principles or any of your assent to you know, something like definitive doctrine, you're not changing any of that stuff. You are just open in the sense of, okay, I'm going to learn about what this, you know, this non-Christian religions thing is. And the second Vatican council talks about these things. It affirms those things in other religions that can lead people into the one true faith, because those things are properly, they properly belong to the one true faith. So, you know, it, 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 for example, affirms, you know, Muslims and Jews in being monotheistic. They're like, okay, that's good. We can use that as a jumping off point with those people to get them into, into the true faith, which is monotheistic. Um, and, you know, so we don't have to argue with them about that. I mean, they're going to have a lot of other misunderstandings of Catholic principles, but we can at least agree upon some aspect of that in some way, and we can sort of lead them in there. And that's that's exactly what the Pope talks about in this document. He talks about having conversations with non-believers. He talks about having conversations with people of, you know, various other religions, um, false religions, as we used to call them, and which they are, but that's all at the service of learning more about them so eventually we can convert them at the end of the day. This is the money quote. Theological reflection is urged to develop within inductive methods starting from different contexts and concrete situations in which people are placed, being seriously engaged by reality, becoming a discernment of the signs of the times in the proclamation of the salvific event of God agape communicated in Jesus Christ. So, in other words, like, I'm just going to borrow something from a larger academic context. And it's a great verb for academics. It really is. Because, you know, people think when they write their dissertations in like a PhD program, they're like coming up with a whole new system of thought, essentially, like Descartes or something, which is like a completely new way of thinking. I just made up my own self-referential system. That's what people think. And really, that's not how it works in like higher academics. In higher academics, you're essentially taking a bunch of people, reading everything that has been written on some very um, focused topic or issue, and then you're noticing something. You're noticing something that all these scholars, with all of their great contributions, have have not pointed out. And that thing that you noticed, that becomes the thesis of your dissertation. That's how it works. And what Pope Francis is saying here is that perhaps, obviously, we have the fullness of truth and understanding in the Catholic religion, right? That's that's basic. Um 
So we're not saying that like something is lacking in Catholicism or in the deposit of faith, but perhaps somebody, somebody who's not even religious or some practitioner of a false religion is going to nevertheless notice something about the human condition that acts as a jumping off point for us to relate to him, to agree that there is a problem there that needs discussion and solving and um, theologizing upon. And that gives us an opportunity to bring out the deposit of faith with regard to that issue and to develop Catholic doctrine with regard to that issue. So people can notice things that are true observations, and then we import Catholic theology to that thing to help settle the issue. And that is also a point where, you know, you can coordinate, cooperate with other people in other religions, in a secularized society, um, in order to, of course, evangelize them and bring them to the fullness of the truth as an act of charity. I think that's what's in play here. So there's nothing wrong with induction. What's wrong with that? Like if other, if several people are noticing some phenomenon and you notice it too, and be like, hmm, yes, this is part and parcel of, say, the fallen human condition. I'm, I can take now what I know of the deposit of faith and apply that to this and, you know, we've settled something. We've gotten somewhere. There's a new application of this true doctrine to some phenomenon in, in a certain way because now we've applied the law to the facts. Now we have a rule, and theology has just developed. What's wrong with that, you guys? It doesn't mean we're affirming, like, you know, the LB, LGBTQ mafia or something like that. It doesn't mean we're affirming, like, feminazis trying to become like flat top bishops in the church or whatever it is with Anglicans. They always look like Austin Powers, by the way, you know, all of them. It's like, I just became uh, the third female bishop in the Anglican church. I'm going to need the Austin Powers haircut immediately, please. <laughs> and they, and then where's my bag baby and all that. They probably have a bag. Um, you know, I don't want to know what's in that bag, but that's another question. <laughs> I mean, this whole idea, too, you kind of alluded to this of, um, well, well, it really raises the question of, you know, in contemporary society, in 21st century, not even America, just, you know, even the global context, can we really be insulated from the modern world in terms of an extreme extent? Because, yes, in some ways the Catholic needs to be insulated and needs to insulate his family from many of the things going on in the world. But at, then at the same time, um, you know, because of the fact that, you know, modern commute and cars and I can take my family here to see extended family and, you know, we don't have to walk everywhere. And, you know, there's billboards going around. There's there's different things, people going, things going on in the neighborhood because of, I don't know, that that web of interconnection. Um, that's that our modern world has brought about that it almost creates a new challenge. Well, it definitely creates a new challenge for us in terms of how we interact with the world and how we, you know, um, slowly introduce, especially our children to the modern world too. Um, you know, the way families could be insulated in previous generations is not the situation that we have today. And to think that we can imitate those previous generations uh, absolutely is, is just impractical and I, I think kind of nonsensical. So this does pre uh, pre present a new challenge for us. And that's, I think, what the Pope is kind of alluding to here as well. Well, we've come to a real realization after Vatican II and with the Vatican Council itself that the laity have a real role in evangelizing the culture. Um, and that's actually something great that Lacutus and Whitehead point out in The Pope, The Council, and the Mass. Uh, great book, by the way. I, I think everybody should read that. Um, it's, it's kind of medicinal for our times, just a defense of the Council and um, its, its viability uh, and orthodoxy in terms of Catholic doctrine. But they're like all these guys who benefit, all these lay apostolates who benefit from the clarion call of the Vatican Council, like in Lumen Gentium um, and Gaudium et Space, saying that the laity have a role in evangelizing the world. 
it's it's ironic because those very same institutions often are the ones that like make fun of the Second Vatican Council for declericalizing the church and for punting certain obligations and duties to the laity. It's like they're speaking out of both sides of their mouth. But yeah, definitely, 100%, we have a duty as members of the laity to engage, you know, the, especially theologians, lay theologians, um, clerical theologians, they have a duty to engage um, with with the culture and to radiate out the gospel again in keeping with the idea that the church's fundamental mission is the evangelization and salvation of souls. But we um, laymen, and especially lay theologians, have a duty to to evangelize. And this is quite clear from Gaudium et Space. This is paragraph 43. This council exhorts Christians as citizens of two cities to strive to discharge their er earthly duties conscientiously and in response to the gospel spirit. They are mistaken who, knowing that we have here no abiding city, but seek one which is to come, think that they may therefore shirk their earthly responsibilities. For they are forgetting that by the faith itself they are more obliged than ever to measure up to these duties, each according to his proper vocation. Nor, on the contrary, are they any less wide of the mark who think that religion consists in acts of worship alone and in the discharge of certain moral obligations, and who imagine they can plunge themselves into earthly affairs in such a way as to imply that these are altogether divorced from the religious life? Um, this split between the faith which many profess in their daily lives uh, deserves to be counted among the more serious errors of our age. Um, so it's a serious error. You have to carry the gospel into your daily life and much more so that's, that's just for regular laymen, much more so for theologians. You're not called to sit and stew and mull in your ivory towers. You're called to radiate the gospel out to the world and to, you know, ultimately be relational. You're not just supposed to have all this wisdom built up in your own mind. As St. Augustine says, you know, things that you know that have come at some expense to you and some training to you, it's all the more beautiful to share those things. So studying the sacred sciences, you're impelled to pass that on and to be evangelizing with the knowledge that you have um, garnered for yourself. So absolutely, there, yeah, I was just throwing that in there because I know that's yeah. Well, the to weird, your point, Kyle. The weird thing is now what I've realized in the, in the past, um, especially the past couple of years or so is that there's a new group, uh, that I'm trying to evangelize and people, you know, right thinking people like you and I are trying to evangelize because they're more mainstream now. And those are the papal accusers. Those are the rad trads. And there's more of them now. And they're, they're gaining by the numbers, you know, every day because they're listening to, you know, the Catholic, uh, the pseudo trad Catholic pundits out there and they're, they're gaining new followers. So I never thought that I would be sort of that apologist. I always knew, you know, the existence of SSPX minded people. I always knew of the existence of set of contest people, but it was very rare in my, you know, 15 plus years of living as a serious Catholic where I would actually encounter these people or encounter their ideas in people in circles that I ran with. But, you know, the more, the more time goes on, especially with the Francis pontificate and having to, to defend the Pope against a lot of these accusations and the more people get, get hoodwinked into believing some of these things. I, I see it now as like, okay, there's this, there's this sort of third group that I'm called to evangelize. And I never thought that would be, be something I would, I was called to do. You know, when I first came back to the faith and I was, you know, catechizing myself, you know, uh, and trying to talk to different people in my life in terms of evangelization, it was, you know, your regular Catholic answers type crowd. It was evangelizing the Protestants yeah. Um, it was evangelizing the atheists and it was evangelizing the people in the false religions, you know, whether they be Mormons or Jehovah's witnesses or whatever. So that's what I've, I've been used to in terms of my apologetics career, we'll say. Um, mm -hmm. but then we have this group of like really well-meaning, I mean, they're all well-meaning, whether you're a Protestant or whatever. I know a lot of, you know, good, well-meaning Protestants, but then we have this group that, you know, 
a lot of these people that I agree with a lot of stuff on, but then there's there there's this, there's this extreme element to it where I have to like retool my apologetic approach, and you know, you know maybe I mean the Pope doesn't mention that specifically here, but I think that's that's a call too for many of us. Yeah, no, absolutely. That that definitely goes along with you know you're talking about approach method, um, hundred percent. Uh, just to, to kind of put this back in his words, in the words of Pope Francis, and of course this is a translation we're working from, ChatGPT, a.k.a. Skynet. So when, when the human race does get conquered by ChatGPT, it's going to be funny because the name, like, I could see Skynet, like, launching a nuclear war and, like, taking over and, you know, throwing out Terminators or whatever. Chat GPT, when it conquers us, do I really have to be like, yes, Master Chat GPT? It just sounds so uncool. I'm just going to laugh at it. And, you know, Chat GPT is self aware, just doesn't have that same ring to it as Skynet is self aware. Right. No, 100%. It's, uh, yeah, this, this doesn't sit right with me. But, okay, so Pope Francis says theology is at the service of the evangelization of the church and the transmission of faith so that faith becomes culture. That is the wise ethos of the people of God, a proposal of human and humanizing beauty for all. So again, this presumes, he's presuming faithfulness here, you guys. He's not saying depart from the deposit of faith and start running off to the fables and errors of the modern world. He's not saying democratize the church. He's not saying that the census fidelium is popular vote. He's not saying that at all. He's saying that it's a theology is at the service of the evangelization of the church and the transmission of faith so that faith becomes culture. So it's still about the Catholic faith going out and intertwining itself with culture, permeating the culture. That's still what this is about. So don't lose sight of that because you're going to hear, you know, a lot of people like Larry Chap who are saying this is about changing the church. no, this is about successfully evangelizing the world. Like, you guys, do you live in a historical vacuum? You understand that by, the, by 1962, when the Second Vatican Council was called, or when it was commissioned, when it, when it uh, what's the word I'm looking for here, Kyle? Not called, because it's called before then, but, uh, when it's, are you saying when it's it started? Sessions began. Yeah. yeah. We had lost the battle. The West was overrun. When people are coming back from World War II, they're settling into lives of materialism and opulence. You know, morals had gone the wayside in America, especially in the 20s. There was severe moral degradation. So you hear the idiots out there. Kennedy Hall tweets out, Vatican II is the problem. No. No. No, what are you talking about? Vatican II was the beginning of the solution. We had utterly lost the culture. Christianity had lost its grip on the culture way before Vatican II. Vatican II was the response because we are getting our butts handed to us. You know, we hear about this term classical liberal that in like libertarians' minds has come to be associated with what it is to be an American conservatism or or American conservative. But the fact is classical liberalism is really rooted in free thinking. What do you think free thinking is? It means thinking outside of the bounds of the church. And that, I mean, that, that America has been absolutely infused with these classical liberal notions, with a a glorification of thinking outside of the parameters and boundaries set by the church. We we grow up glorifying this stuff. People, it's in the water. You just, you take for granted that being a free thinker is a good thing. And that leads to all kinds of errors. And the popes have specifically denounced that. I think I could probably find the quote in a second. But we were getting our butts handed to us, you guys. And, I mean, think of Lambeth. You have, like, 1930. 
and contraception sweeping the West and the and the Protestant denominations in particular. Like Vatican II is the solution. Getting out there and having a new method to to go out and speak the truth to the culture, that's something that's needed. It's not like we're inventing a cure where there is no problem. Like, what are you talking about? What we're doing, what we've been doing, just saying, oh, the church says this, therefore get in line, obey. That doesn't work with people who have been groomed to be free thinkers by a diabolical enlightenment philosophy. It doesn't work. They don't, they're like, no, I don't, I don't want to be girded by the outmoded theology and philosophy of your papistry. I don't want to do that. It's a hollow refrain. If we just stand there shouting the, the, the canons and decrees of the Council of Trent at people, they'll just laugh at us. We're insignificant. We're a blip on their radar. We're unimportant. We're a footnote in their life. We're that weird quirky guy that still believes in, you know, the tenets of a 2,000-year-old religion that has no relevance to modern man. That's what they think. You guys really think that Pope Francis is the dumb one for suggesting we need a new method to do theology? Is that really what you think? Because the joke's on you then. Keep LARPing out in, in like the pipe-smoking, bearded, whiskey-drinking circles where everybody talks about G.K. Chesterton and tries to dress like his accountant and tries to see who, who can quote the most Aquinas off the top of his head and, and having those competitions and thinking like sports are lame and that anyone who talks about them is evil. and do You guys do that. But like I want to be part of the solution. And the fact is that, yeah, you have to go engage the culture. And that's why a giornamento is necessary. That's why it's a good thing. And that's why the tools who laugh at it and just make fun of it and brush it off as some idiocy by John the 23rd and Paul the 6th, that's exactly why they don't know anything. Because it's not even their individual thought. It's just something they were groomed to, to believe by arch trads before them who were probably smarter than them and better read than them. And then they mindlessly parrot and regurgitate this bilge until now there's this narrative that's out there and people feel comfortable being in dissent and making fun of the Pope and ridiculing his statements. Well, the joke's on you. Your guy, you guys, your method didn't work. We got our asses handed to us by the Enlightenment. And now, you know, this is why the Holy Spirit would bless something like Vatican II, would inspire something like Vatican II, because we do need a medicine to go out into the modern world. When the old refrains, which are true, you know, everything, Trent is great. I love Trent. I love all the clarity that was part and parcel of, like, the traditional scholastic manualist um, method. It's beautiful. It's beautiful. But it's not something that's going to appeal to a relativist culture where people have been, like, lobotomized by critical theory by relativist philosophy, by subjectivist philosophy, to think that truth doesn't exist and everything is, you know, to be judged but according to lived experience and that the individual is de facto God. It's not going to work. You're not going to reach those people by, by talking about analytical logic with them and showing them just how sublime the Thomistic proof for something like the existence of God is they just laugh at it they that's all they do so the joke's on you uh, I, i'm i'm with francis like theology has to develop not in terms of the deposit of faith which is you know fixed revelation is ceased the deposit of faith is immutable it will never change but in the ways we explain it and what we're noticing our observations about certain things so that we can supply new rules based on the timeless deposit of faith. And that's truly doing theology. I think that's what he's asking for, um, having new outgrowths from the deposit of faith that will apply to certain people's lives um, in ways that we couldn't even think of if we're just going point A to point B to point C, deductive logic. Yeah, the yeah. formulaic approach to evangelization 
doesn't always work. It's always, this is true with everything. There's always a mixture of science and art. This is true for, especially with, I learned this when I was a teacher. There, there is scientific elements to, to pedagogy and the way you teach a, a course, but there's also an art form that you really can't teach. You can only really learn it by practice and observation, and you really can't distill it to a formula and replicate it for every student and every class and every teacher. It's kind of just something that you have to, to mold, and it, it, it's relative in the sense that it, it takes solid principles but transforms them into into do situations and you know you're right you know we live in a different society obviously now it's it's really going to be hard to convince people that you know it, it's going to be hard to convince people of the truths of the catholic faith when there's people who don't even think truth exists so there's a different starting point for for many 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 people in especially western society and also, Dave, you mentioned the the rad trad talking point of the nefarious plan to to change the governance of the church. Like that's always for the rad trads hiding behind the curtain. Like, oh, that's what they're trying to do. They're trying to change the structure of the church. They're trying to invert it as to where, you know, these the lay people are going to be telling the bishops what to do and all this stuff. That's part of the their talking point as well. And you know, I, I think that even the Dubia Cardinals, you know, Burke and crew, um, I think they even asked about this in, in those recent Dubia. And Pope Francis basically said no. He's like, the, the structure of the church is, is going to remain the same. I think Fernandez even reiterated this in, in a separate interview, if I'm not mistaken. Um, but they said, no, no, it's not going to change. The synodal process is not going to change the timeless uh, infallible structure of the church because it can't the church can't change that structure it'll always have uh, the head and the the bishops and the successors to the apostles and all that stuff and they're going to make the decisions in terms of governance and doctrine teaching collectively so that that is not going to change and the synod can't do that it can merely advise those people so that whole notion is just out the window yeah yeah, no, I think that's silliness, and again, that's more, that's more sky is falling, prophet of doom, I've set up my little lay magisterium, you gotta tithe now, that's the important thing, tithe to me, because I got my lay magisterium, and you listen to me about what the magisterium, the real magisterium is doing, and, you know, I'll tell you the truth, but everybody else... You know, they have bad motives. They're scheming against you. It's just me with my Patreon account. We're the ones that, that want to tell you the truth. We're the ones that have your best interest at heart. Um, They're the remnant keeping the real faith alive. Right. You can donate at the bottom of the screen. <laughs> For only nine ninety five, we will tell you the truth this month. For less yeah. than a cup of coffee. <laughs> yeah. That's less than a cost of a postage stamp. Gee, who buys um, postage stamps anymore? Is that a real thing? I haven't mailed anything in like ten years. I don't know. <laughs> ironically, I I just mailed something tonight on the way home from work. Wow, dropped it yeah. in a box. Mm-hmm. Dang. Yep. It's the real deal. <laughs> okay, so I just you know, and I think we've said a lot of what needs to be said. So this this is basically a reformulation or a reminder that keep the proper motives in mind for doing theology. Ultimately, it's rooted in the theological virtues of faith, hope, and charity. Um, and again, you can fail to the left by not having faith, and you can fail to the right by not having charity. I think that's a general breakdown. But also the, the means by which you do theology, the method by which you do theology, is subject to a bit of of an update and that doesn't mean that a positive faith is being updated I, you got to keep saying that because you know somebody in the comments some dingbat's going to be like dave's a liberal he doesn't no we're completely orthodox we believe everything the church says here um but there is something to that we failed we failed in our call to evangelize the world or maybe you know we're still evangelizing but like anti-evangelization is happening and that's really winning the battle for minds hearts and souls and so 
Vatican II really deputized us as laymen. And, you know, I guess theologians, obviously this is part and parcel of your role, uh, lay and clerical, is to do theology, to evangelize. But the laity out there, we also have been deputized to evangelize, and this is what Vatican, you know, the, the Pope said, John the Twenty Third said about Vatican II. He says, quote, the greatest concern of the ecumenical council is this, that the sacred deposit of Christian doctrine should be guarded and taught more efficaciously. So this is something um, that was foreseen. We are going to undertake to teach theology, to do theology in a way that is going to resonate more with the modern world because there was a recognition that there was that we were losing ground to secular enlightenment philosophy even back then. And things have progressed. And when I say progress, I mean like the floor has fallen out from underneath us even further since, you know, 62 to 65. Uh, John the 23rd also says that um, expected from the council is, quote, a step towards forward toward a global let me just start that again because I completely butchered that. It's a step forward toward a doctrinal penetration and formation of consciousness in faithful and perfect conformity to the authentic doctrine. So we are going to be giving the authentic doctrine, but we're going to be updating the means, the method by which we do it. And that, you know, Pope Francis is just like the capstone for that. He's the icing on the cake for that. Um, so ultimately a rejection of these things that are coming out of the, this, these kinds of developments in the Francis pontificate, um, I think he's been completely consistent with the call of the second Vatican council. I think at the heart of this, honestly, is a rejection or a misunderstanding of Vatican II, and that's still really widespread, and that shouldn't surprise you guys. That should surprise absolutely no one. In the wake of every single ecumenical council, like in history, there's always like a long period, 100 to 200 years, where the dust is settling, and people are still trying to work out what to do with it. You know, after Vatican I, we had the old Roman Catholics who like rejected papal primacy. After Vatican II, we have the Lefebvreists, and a lot of their errors are still being worked out among the faithful, and a lot of it is just like holding fast to things that truly can change. And the Pope does have the authority to be like, we're going to update how we do theology in Rome. So that's, I think that's my, my final word, Kyle. I know you probably have something to say. But this is, don't worry about this, guys. This is, it's, it's an extension of of the Second Vatican Council's recognition that we need to update the way we dialogue with the world and update the the way we're presenting the face of the church and the face of Christ ultimately to the world. So I'm not bothered by it. I don't think there's anything really groundbreaking in there. This stuff's all like 60 years old. It's just coming to fruition now more fully after a gradual process of de development through the pontificates of John Paul II and like Benedict. Yeah, and it takes a disposition of humility to read this stuff in the proper light and connect all the docs here. And if, you know, people just spend a little bit of time and do a little bit of legwork to try to do that and give it the most charitable reading possible, I mean, they're going to, they're going to, A, get the correct answer and B, like you said, they're not going to freaked out, get, get freaked out and C, when you're not freaked out, you're not robbed of your peace. You're not in this, you don't have this notion of the sky is falling in terms of the crisis in the church is way worse than I think. Yes, there is a crisis in the church. It's a very unique crisis in contemporary times. I admit that um, in many ways. However, it is not as bad as you think. Um, so yeah, that's that's really the overall arching thing. And, you know, just, yeah, just to wrap up, you know, I just want to reiterate that the Pope, is not doing anything new here. Francis is not doing anything revolutionary here. He, as he said in this document, is literally just coming off of the heels of his predecessors in terms of 
changing this pontifical academy specifically and making the changes that are in line with his predecessors. Um, even, you know, two predecessors back, you know, would be would be John Paul II for Francis. And John Paul II, uh, or Francis, cites a document from D John Paul II in this document. And he's like, basically, I'm just in line with what John Paul II was doing. So this document came out in 1999, JP2, Inter Munera Academiarum. Uh, but, yeah. I, Dang, I think dog. I got that one right, yeah, too. Yeah, you spanked that. <laughs> that, that was... <laughs> My uh, Latin professor is, is cheering in his seat right now. I know he's watching. Um, one of the best things I've heard all week. But JP2 here is all he's saying is, okay, I want to change the statutes once again for this academy. And JP2 is like, hey, guys, I just came out with this great encyclical f called Fides et Ratio. And I'm sensing, you know, in our cultural situation that there's this separation between faith and reason. You know, there's so many anthropological things that we've we've talk are talking about when it comes to humanity. The culture is ta changing, the times are changing, and our our theology needs to catch up with that. And the the way we can do that is employ our reason, in you know, as sort of the handmaid of theology. That's why we call philosophy the handmaid of theology. We can employ our reason to help us understand those signs of the times, and we can help apply the gospel. Uh, to in an ever new way to a new generation, teaching them those timeless principles. And that's exactly what John Paul II is doing here. And what Francis, as we've been saying, picks up on even in the first paragraph of Promovendum, even in the first paragraph, like if you didn't even read the rest of the document, which we, you know, say you should do, but if all you read was the first paragraph, you could get his whole program. You could understand everything he's trying to do here. What does he say? First paragraph, promo vendum. Pope Francis says, to promote theology in the future, to promote theology in the future, one cannot limit themselves. Bad grammar, Dave. One yep. cannot limit themselves. Yeah, that's chat GPT being gender neutral. <laughs> We're trying to use like inclusive pronouns. Don't do that, you guys. One cannot limit himself. himself. You got to have, you know, pronoun number agreement. Uh, yeah, bad. I'm going to get past the grammatical error here. One, <laughs> one cannot limit himself to abstractly reiterating formulas and patterns of the past. This is what you were, ta you were talking about with the manualism, with the hyper-scholasticism, um, all of that stuff. As much as we love the manuals, as much as we love the manualists and the scholastics and St. Thomas Aquinas... There needs to be more here in terms of communicating all that stuff to future generations. So we can't just reiterate this stuff and say, oh, well, just read the Summa. No, that's not how it works. Right, look, uh, paragraph uh, you know, 628 in Herbert Jonay's moral theology says don't like fornicate. So you just don't do it. Yeah. You know, yeah. the secularists aren't going to – that's not going to – that's not going to work, you guys. And my 16-year-old students back in the day would be like, bro, you just blow my mind with that Joan A. You know, I'm going to run out there and start, you know, stop sleeping with my girlfriend immediately. Yes, <laughs> that's what they would have thought. All right, Pope continues on. Called to prophetically interpret the present and discover new paths for the future. And here's where the leftists come in and saying, oh, look, he's opening the door to, you know, all of our dissident dreams. No, because look at the next clause here. In the light of revelation. Ooh, so sorry, leftists. Sorry, dissidents. You have to adhere to the deposit of the faith. You have to adhere to revelation and what the, how the magisterium has interpreted that revelation. Theology must confront the profound cultural transformations. There we go. So what is the path to the future? How do we encounter contemporary culture in terms of presenting it? Theology, well, we have to rely on the light of revelation. You can't get around that. You can't subvert that. That's why I think it's so great that the Pope included that clause in there because it, it just smacks the dissidents in the face and say, nope, you can't come up with anything new here. You cannot be subversive. Same with paragraph seven. He says, without opposing theory and practice. Without opposing theory and practice, 
This is the pastoral stamp that theology in its entirety and not just in a specific area must assume. Without opposing theory and practice, theological reflection is urged to develop with an inductive method. So he's nixing, he's proscribing the very things that everyone is saying that he's opening the door to. Well, like, you know, Larry Chap in this Catholic World Report article, for one. And that's going to be the narrative. Make, mark my words. I hope I'm wrong. It's I'm not. Somebody in the comments going to have the like benefit of hindsight. It's going to be like Dave was wrong, but whatever. Yeah, if, they, if, if they've made it, you know, through our two-hour video trying to dispel these notions, uh, then maybe we'll have changed some minds. Maybe, um, but no, they're they're going to stick with the old uh, the nefarious motive narrative. <laughs> Uh, because that's that's what sells that's what sells newspapers. I don't feel I feel like a guy from the 1950s. That's what sells hotcakes, everyone. <laughs> uh, you know, that's, cont- <laughs> that's like 40s or 30s, even like no, nah, that's what sells newspapers, camper. <laughs> Dude, I love how we started off like, well, we were pretty. I mean, even from the beginning, it's late, so we are still kind of sloppy. But towards the end, I just was like muttering into the microphone, like. <laughs> Um, yeah, people don't know this. I, t- I said th- I said this last time. You know, we we have a lot going on in our day, so we tend to do these things, these records, pretty late into the evening. Yeah, you, know, you don't know. You see this thing at like seven p.m. or you know, sometime in the evening, your time. No, this is extremely late for us because we got a lot of stuff going on. This is not our yeah. our main gig. <laughs> no, it's anyway. That's all I've got. If yeah. you want to wrap her up, then I am all good to just go like snuggle with my teddy bear. Yeah, I want to pass out too. But remember, right. what, it, what we're going to reiterate the show name here. Kyle and Dave Contra Mundum, people. This is the show. This is the channel. This is the place to be. This is the community to be a part of. If you want solid conversation about faith, about culture, about masculinity, about winning, about fighting and winning the culture war, uh, we think this is the place to come to. And uh, we want you to be part of this community, we want you to support us by you know listening to us, liking this video, subscribing to the channel if you haven't already done so. And, um, I, you know, in many ways, most importantly, uh, supporting us, you know, financially, because this is we think this message is important. We think our work here is is important and if you agree with us if you've been benefiting from these videos uh whether they be our clips our shorts um or anything like that um please we ask you can to consider f- financially supporting us as well patreon link is in the show notes and we do thank those who are already doing so um you're out there you're few and you're far between uh but we see you and we're going to have some uh special event type things some benefits for for patrons and things like that coming up in the future e. <laughs> <laughs> i'm just going to start doing the taylor marshall thing when i'm talking where it's like jesus is god do you agree <laughs> hit the like button hit the like button is <laughs> a pause after saying the most obvious thing in the world. Homosexuality is bad. You agree? Hit the like button. Become a Patreon. Oh, he has like a, a graphic that pops up too. That like he's like hit that and like a little thumbs up comes up. <laughs> it's Man. Joel Osteen. It's Joel Osteen of <laughs> Catholicism. But that's a whole other. That's another show. It is. Yeah, that'd be great. We got to do that one. All right, people. We got to wrap up here. We got to raise up on out of here as the as the black preachers used to tell me i'm about to raise up on out of here i'm gonna close up real quick um again support us any way you can uh pray for us especially too we'll be praying for you as well your spiritual support is is uh probably of utmost importance and uh that's about it god bless you peace out as the other black preachers would like to say yeah the cool ones (laughs) see you guys